Uh, and by the way, I decided not to give a tutorial uh, because I somehow felt that, uh, well, I didn't know what to do. So, uh, it, but uh, I will show some, uh, you know, snippets of uh, pseudocode, and if we have time, at least uh, after today's lectures, I will uh, show some programs that I put online, uh, and you know, maybe show you a bit, little bit how to run them if you want to try yourselves. Anyway, so today I will uh, talk about this stochastic series expansion method, uh, and again, I will. Um, uh, focus on quantum spins. Uh, this method can be used for other systems as well, but uh, in, in these lectures I will basically just talk about uh, quantum spins. Uh, the second lecture will be on a different kind of method. So this is a finite temperature method, although you can go to basically the ground state as well if you go to low enough temperature. But there's another way to more directly grow to, go to the ground state by, by projection, and that can actually be done for uh, some quantum spin systems very conveniently if you go to the valence bond basis of, of the spins. So I will talk about that. Uh, and then uh, I don't want to just talk about the you know, basic techniques to generate uh, uh, you know, numerical data on our finite lattices. I also want to talk about how to analyze those results to draw conclusions about the thermodynamic limit, which is normally uh, what we want to do. So I want to talk about, uh, well, several things, but uh, in particular uh, a way which is quite uh, convenient for analyzing critical points, okay? Uh, and then the last lecture I want to uh, talk about a slightly different topic, but it's still Monte Carlo and still spins, but it has to do with out of, out of equilibrium physics. So in particular, uh, uh, things like quenches, ramps, and uh, uh, annealing, and quantum annealing. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, the connections to quantum computing there as well, which I want to talk about. Okay, but uh, today, uh, stochastic series expansion, uh, I can mention that I have this pretty long review article which discusses quantum spins, methods, and uh, also some physics. It's 207 pages, something like that, and it's published in some conference series, but you can easily find it uh, on archive. Okay, so today's, uh, or let's say this first lecture today, uh, I want to talk about the models a little bit first uh, before jumping into the methods, just so that we have an idea of, you know, what systems we are actually going to study. So just briefly about the Heisenberg model, which is the basic model that everything starts from here. Uh, and then, uh, although I will talk about the stochastic series expansion method, I first want to give a brief introduction to path integrals on the lattice. You have already seen uh, path integrals uh, during this course, but maybe not on the lattice. And there's a quite neat relationship between the stochastic series and uh, the path integrals. So I want to uh, convey that. Uh, and then I get into the actual stochastic series expansion, which is, again, the alternative to doing a path integral. Uh, and I want to show in a little bit of detail how to implement that for the spin one-half Heisenberg model in 2D uh, in this case, but it can be done easily in other dimensions as well. Uh, and if you have time, I will look at a program that I put online, and I will tell you where you can find that program as well. Okay, so quantum antiferromagnets. So uh, many materials uh, are well described by the Heisenberg model, which, which looks like this. So this is a, a spin rotationally invariant uh, interaction. And of course, the spin on each side can be anything, but uh, today I will focus on spin one half. And in the simplest case, this uh, lattice where these spins sit on uh, is something like a square lattice, and you have only nearest neighbor interactions. But of course, you can have uh, other lattices as well. Uh, and uh, the lattices in general, you can classify into two kinds, or I should say the interactions combined with the lattice. So in a bipartite system, uh, these interacting neighbors always sit on different sublattices. So it's somehow possible to decompose the lattice into <laughs> two groups of sites. Here I denote them by you know, the white and red dots, so they are forming this checkerboard pattern. And uh, you see that 
if I have nearest neighbor interactions here, this i and j here is always on, on different sublattices. Okay, so that's called uh, bipartite. And that's, if we have an antiferromagnet, that's compatible with nail order, so this antiferromagnetic pattern. <laughs> so here I put these arrows to indicate the spins, and you can see that, of course, the, on the white sides I have one orientation of the spins, and on, on the red sides the orientation is the opposite. So, so always if you have a bipartite situation, uh, you can have a kind of antiferromagnet on, on, on that uh, system. Uh, okay, uh, well, I mean, you can have antiferromagnets in other cases too, but it's easy to see that if you have a classical system, for example, it, it goes into that state, right? Uh, but you can also have other states. So even if you have a, some interaction like that, and okay, maybe we later add some other terms, uh, even if the system can have nail order, in the quantum case, it doesn't necessarily have. So I want to say a few more words about that later. But let's look at the bipartite case first. So the, in that case, we, we cannot satisfy the conditions mentioned here. So the simplest case of, of that is, is just the triangle, or you can think of a, an extended triangular lattice, but I just show one uh, triangle here. Uh, so then, uh, uh, you know, we have what's also called frustration. So if you think about uh, wanting to form an antiferromagnetic state, it's just not possible. So here, if I have just icing spins uh, and, uh, and I can orient them as these colored dots here. So let's say I have down, down, and up. You see that, that uh, there's a one bond which is not antiferromagnetically oriented, and it's not possible to, to have all bonds satisfied, happy with the antiferromagnetic interaction. So then uh, you can get some other kind of order. So in fact, in the triangular lattice, you get something like a 120 degree antiferromagnet, where you know, they are not pointing opposite to each other, they form, form this angle. Uh, and in general, if you have some more complicated lattices, you can have uh, all kinds of states, including spin liquids, which have no uh, order at all. Okay. So today I will focus on bipartite lattices, and, and that's because uh, those are the ones we can actually do quantum Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, as I will mention a little, little bit further along for these, non-bipartite cases, we, we have the so-called sign problem, which makes simulations very hard. But for these systems, and not only for the Heisenberg model, one can put other kinds of interactions here too, which somehow have a, a bipartite uh, property. Uh, we can do you know, very nice simulations. Okay, so that means that we are normally studying uh, antiferromagnetism, and we may be studying the destruction of antiferromagnetism when we get to some other state. Okay, so the order parameter we are dealing with is what we call the sublattice magnetization, or sometimes we call it the staggered magnetization. So it's just uh, the operator is just summing up all the spins, but putting this phase factor in, which uh, corresponds to you know ro rotating half of the spins. So if you have a classical system and uh, uh, you go to zero temperature, uh, for example, if you just look at this case here, then this would be the ground state configuration. So then this uh, uh, expectation value, and if you take the absolute value of it, because it could be you know, oriented any, in any direction in spin space, the spins, of course, have three components. So if I take the, just the magnitude of the order parameter, it, it will always be S, classically, at zero temperature. Okay? <clears throat> but uh, if we look at uh, a finite system, or if we really, yeah, if we look at the finite system and then really think of, of the partition function as including all possible ground state configurations, of course, there's an infinite number of them. Uh, so if we break the symmetry, we get into one of them, but in principle, in a finite lattice, we should include all of them. So then uh, uh, the magnetization expectation value itself is formally zero, but we can always avoid that subtlety by looking at the squared order parameter, which doesn't care about how the spins are overall oriented, what, what angle they form. Okay. Okay, so I, again, I'm still talking about classical systems here. If we raise the temperature, then of course this order parameter is, is reduced, okay? And at some point, 
it will vanish in a, in a phase transition, right? Okay, but if you look at quantum systems, and we stay at zero temperatures, we look at the ground state, then you can see that this kind of state is not even an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. If you, uh, well, I didn't repeat the Hamiltonian here, but you can just try and see this is not an eigenstate uh, of, uh, uh, of the Hamiltonian. So that means that if there is antiferromagnetic order in the ground state, there must be some fluctuations on top of it. So that means that this order parameter is reduced from its maximal classical value even at, uh, at uh, zero temperature. And in fact, the order can completely go away at zero temperature as well, if there are enough flu quantum fluctuations. And um, we will talk about, in particular in the third lecture, I will you know, talk about such things more. The first two lectures will be mainly focused on, on methods, but I will um, maybe mention some some of these issues further along as well. Okay, but there's an important theorem which applies to, to breaking of a continuous symmetry. So in, uh, in this Heisenberg model, the Hamiltonian has the full rotational invariance, right? So if we uh, break the symmetry, we break a continuous symmetry. And the Mermin-Wagner theorem tells us uh, that, uh, uh, let me not talk about where this comes from, but I'm sure many of you know it already. Uh, that if we take the Heisenberg quantum model on a 1D chain, there can be no nail order. That order is destroyed by quantum fluctuations in one dimension. And uh, if we go to two dimensions, we can have order only at zero temperature. The uh, order is destroyed by thermal fluctuations. So that's true, you know, both classically and quantum mechanically. Okay. Uh, and in 3D, we can have order at zero temperature as well as at finite temperature. So, so th this is an important thing to, to keep in mind when we look at systems in different dimensions. And we have this uh, full rotational invariance of the Hamiltonian, no uh, spin and isotropies. Okay, so now let's come to quantum Monte Carlo. So what we are doing in Monte Carlo is we are taking this quantum mechanical uh, you know, thermal expectation value, which is defined with, you know, the operator H and uh, some operator A that we want to calculate the expectation value of. We have to somehow rewrite this operator expression in a form which is what we use in important sampling in, in the Monte Carlo simulations, as uh, Werner talked uh, about yesterday. So we have to have some space of configurations, C, so C denotes some sum configuration. And now in the quantum case, it will, the configurations can look more complicated than, uh, you know, the uh, lattice you start from and the spins that you put there. It, it can be something else. There's just something that gives us some configuration space with some weight function and then this uh, observable gets some value in each of those configurations. So then we can sample this with the weight W uh, as, as you would do in a classical simulation, okay? Right, now in the quantum case, there is the possibility that actually we may not know how to do this in a way which uh, uh, gives all positive weights. And in Monte Carlo simulations, of course, you use the weights as relative probabilities. So if they're not positive definite, you have a problem and that's called the sign problem and it's it's really bad. Uh, it's it's the you know it's it's plaguing uh, you know the whole field. On the other hand, you can say that well, of course, things cannot be so easy. So you know this is just uh, what we have to deal with, and all the time people find uh, you know more systems where we know how to do this in a positive, definite way. Okay. Uh, so so that, that, that's what we have to do. And uh, there are many different ways to do it. Uh, you can apply all kinds of transformations or, or tricks here to, to get something that works. Uh, so I just mentioned a couple of ways here. So word lines, that's basically, uh, you know, the imaginary time path integral, which I will talk about a little bit. You can do the stochastic series expansion. And for fermions where, you know, these methods in general have uh, sign problems, there are 
at least in some cases, some other kinds of methods that, that can deal with these systems. But in general, fermions are still, of course, difficult. Uh, okay, so this is if we want to do you know, finite temperature calculations. So if we want to just go to the ground state, there are, there's an alternative, or several alternatives, I should say. So you can do projections. So that, that's basically uh, starting from a trial state, which, by the way, is, is a bad name. I will say a few more things about that later, but, but this is what, what people normally call it in this field. So you take a trial state, which basically could be anything or almost anything. And then you apply some operator, which when some parameter is large, in this case, this power m, or in this case, this number beta, when those are large, one can show that you, you just uh, get the gr ground state filtered out. I will say more about that in the next lecture. OK, so, so in, in the end, it turns out that these two are quite similar. So I will uh, talk about this kind of finite temperature methods today, uh, this, this first lecture and this in the second lecture. And in the second lecture, I will also show you explicitly that they are almost the same in terms of technical implementations. Uh, it, it's basically just a question of a boundary effect. Here you have a kind of periodic time boundaries, and here you have a uh, open time boundaries, but okay, what that means will be more clear in a moment. Okay, so these things can be done particularly efficiently for spin one half models, you know, the Heisenberg models and extended uh, kinds of Heisenberg models. Yes, please. Right. Uh, okay, so I could answer that now, but since that's a topic of uh, of uh, next lecture, I will leave it to next lecture. But I can just say that okay, there's under some conditions. If the eigenvalue of the lowest state is the largest in magnitude, you get the ground state. Otherwise, you could also, in principle, get the highest state. But you can always fix that with some constant. But I will return to that question uh, in the next lecture. Uh, okay, uh, so. Uh, Actually, often we write the Hamiltonian in this way. Uh, you will see that later today. Uh, then you can recognize this as a singlet projector. So the Heisenberg model is basically a sum of singlet projectors. And those have some very nice uh, properties that make it easy, particularly easy to study these spin one half models. And that's nice because uh, there are also many, many interesting open, exciting problems for spin one-half models, even for bipartite lattices. So there was some time, you know, some years ago, uh, you know, everybody said, well, everything that has been done with, uh, everything that can be done with, uh, without a sign problem has al always, uh, has already been done. And uh, that's still not true. It wasn't true 20 years ago when people told me that, and it's not true today. So there's actually a huge amount of stuff to do, and we can do it really well because we can go to big lattices. OK, uh, so I hope I can convey some of that as well. OK, now let's talk a little bit about uh, path integrals then. So again, we want to compute this thermal expectation value, uh, where beta is the inverse temperature. And we also may, also in this formulation, we may want to go to zero temperature. So the, the main difficulty here, of course, is how to deal with this exponential operator, because it's uh, not so easy in practice to take the exponential of a, a huge operator. If you have a big system, the size of the Hilbert space is 2 to the n, where n is the number of spins in this spin 1 half case. So how, how do we do that? So in the path integral, what you do first, you slice uh, uh, this partition function or this exponential operator. So first, you just write it as a product of smaller operators, meaning that there's a delta delta tau here, which is beta divided by L, and you just do a product of those operators. And that's exact, and it seems like we have done nothing. But now we can start to work with this, because now if L is large, this delta tau is small, and we can start to do some approximations. OK, and, and later we will get rid of the approximations. But just to get started, we do some approximations. OK, so what we do first is we take a complete set of states and then insert between all these uh, exponential operators. So now you start to see where Monte Carlo 
can uh, come into play here because we have a lot of states here and, and uh, there's a lot of summations and of course that's exactly what Monte Carlo can do very well to do uh, sums over a huge uh, configuration spaces. So eventually, you know, there will be sums over these states done stochastically. Anyway, this is still uh, uh, completely uh, exact here. Yeah? And uh, we can choose whatever basis which is practical for us to, to work with here. So for spin systems of the kind I'm discussing here, you can just think of the up and down uh, Z component basis. Okay, so but now we, we still cannot easily uh, work with this because these are still big uh, big matrices. And now one can proceed in in different ways. Many of you probably have seen uh, something like this before using the throttle approximation. I want to use something which is easier. So imagine that this delta tau is very small. Then we can just do a Taylor expansion of these exponentials, mm -hmm. and we just keep the leading uh, uh, order, the linear order in tau uh, contributions. So then we get something like that. Okay, so that of course has a, a, a big uh, error. The error in, in each term here is of the order of delta tau uh, because in it's delta tau squared in each factor, but we have uh, you know L factors and if you look at that, that cancels one, one of those, so it's order delta tau. But it turns out that we can actually very easily, and this was realized only maybe 20, 20 years ago or so, uh, that one can actually very easily, or pretty easily, let's say, take the delta tau goes to zero limit in the program itself, so, so that one can eventually get rid of the error. But for now, let's just keep a finite delta tau and, and see what we can do with this. Okay, and let's let's do an example. Then it's uh, normally clearer. So let's look at um, a system of hardcore bosons, meaning that you have a lattice with bosons, but on each side you can have only zero or one boson. So this is just uh, uh, hopping here, boson hopping, uh, and this is actually equivalent to the X Y model. I'm sure many of you have seen this as well. So you can just do a mapping where. Uh, the empty side corresponds to say minus one half, and the uh, uh, the occupied side corresponds to plus one half, and then these hopping operators just correspond to these spin raising and lowering operators. There's just a factor of of two coming in uh, in front, uh, and you can identify this with the x x y y part of the interaction. So this is the equivalent to the spin one half x y model. Okay. So let's see what we do there, uh, what we can do with that. So uh, this was the expression we had, and uh, now if, if the Hamiltonian is this Hamiltonian, which consists of all these um, uh, raising and lowering operators, which have the effect, well, let, let's look at it for bosons. It's a little bit easier just in terms of, of pictures. So we have, have these bosons that are jumping between nearest neighbors. So now it's useful to do things uh, graphically. So what I do is, uh, this state here is represented down here. So this is the state zero indicated there. And you see that I have three bosons here on 12 sides or whatever it is. Uh, and then the next matrix element here uh, corresponds to the following, or the next state, the following uh, line and so on. Okay? So you see we have the same state here and here, so we have to have the same state here and here. Okay, and what can happen here? Uh, well, this Hamiltonian can jump these bosons, and for a given uh, you know, picture here, uh, corresponding to a given term here, only one thing can happen, so to speak, at a time, if I uh, really break down this into all possible paths. So at each step here, you know, one term of the Hamiltonian is active. So here, for example, you know, one boson is jumping like there. Uh, occasionally, none of them is active because we also have the one here. So you see, there are some cases where, where nothing happens between two slices. It just stays as it is. Okay, so this is the graphical representation of one term of this thing when we replace H by, by the whole sum of, of terms, okay? So let's focus on the left one for now. So you have a starting state, and then the bosons, uh, you know, fluctuate, and then eventually they come back again to where they were. Uh, and now, if you look at the weight here, so 
uh, this product of matrix elements, that's the weight of a given configuration. Uh, and you can see if nothing happens, the weight is one on each slice. And if something happens, it's just delta tau. Uh, well, it's minus delta tau times the matrix element of the particular term being active. And that matrix element is always one, because it's just hopping one boson. And there's a minus sign which cancels that minus sign. So the weight is just the number of these jumps that you have in the configuration. That's, that's the path weight. I'm running out of batteries here, so I'm going to try to change the batteries while I continue talking. Uh, now, if you look at the, the right uh, uh, picture there, that's a, an interesting uh, uh, concept that that picture is, is illustrating, namely the winding number. So if you have periodic boundary conditions, uh, then uh, you know one boson can go out uh, on, um, in one end of the system, and it can enter at the other boundary. OK, so we have a, like a ring. The system is forming a ring. Uh, and then we can have cyclic permutations of the system. So what, what happens here is that here, oops, oh, I hit the wrong button here. Uh, sorry about that. So here, uh, 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 we still have uh, the same configuration here and here, uh, because these bosons are indistinguishable. If I had you know, different colors of these bosons, for example, then uh, you know, I would have permuted my colors here. So then this would not be allowed, because I have to have the sa exactly the same state here and here. But because these are indistinguishable, this is still exactly the same state here as here. Although the bosons have permuted during uh, you know, their, their travel in imaginary time. So we call this, by the way, the imaginary time direction, because this e to the minus beta h is formally the Schrodinger time evolution operator in imaginary time. Right? So it's e to the minus delta h propagates a time, uh, imaginary time delta. OK, so the, these, uh, these, these configurations which wrap around the boundaries like that uh, are said to have winding numbers. So this has winding number 0, and this has winding number 1. And this winding number is actually an important concept that will also appear in the stochastic series method. And it allows us to calculate, for example, in the case of bosons, uh, the superfluid stiffness of the system. So the ability of a system to do a lot of winding is related to its uh, superfluid stiffness. Okay, and in a spin system that corresponds to uh, what's called the spin stiffness, which is basically uh, corresponding to an elastic modulus of the system, the energy cost of twisting the spin uh, direction in an ordered system. OK, I will not say much more about uh, winding numbers uh, in terms of their physical significance. But, but, but basically, this is an important uh, thing to sample. Because uh, in the end, we want to sample these paths stochastically. And we would like to make sure, at least if we want to measure the superfluid density, that we can also you know, generate fluctuations in this winding number. So uh, the kind of moves that one could imagine using for, for sampling here would be some local deformations of, of these uh, word lines. So these are uh, what's called word lines. So you can introduce and, and uh, remove uh, kinks in various ways. Uh, and that changes uh, the weight, because we, this nk, which is the number of kinks, is decreasing or increasing. And then that you can use in a metropolis accept reject uh, probability. Uh, but these local updates, you see, they cannot really change this winding number. They cannot change the winding number because they only act locally. So they cannot uh, make these uh, global permutations. So to do uh, uh, changes in the winding numbers, one needs some global updates. So that will, will be an important issue. Uh, OK, so how about uh, expectation values? So now we were just, for now, sampling uh, basically the normalization of, uh, of a system, uh, or the partition function, uh, I should say, uh, in this case. Uh, so, so how about uh, some expectation value? Well, if we have an expectation value, 
uh, we have a very similar thing here. So now it's one over z, z we just discussed. And now there's a similar uh, thing here, but we have one change in one of these matrix elements here where, where the operator A that we are interested in is located. And again, we want to write the whole thing in a form, uh, suitable form on the color sampling. So we have already talked about you know, the weight, and now we, we should see what is this uh, estimator for uh, some uh, physical quantities. Now, it's very easy if you have a quantity which is diagonal in the occupation number basis, because then you know, this just becomes a number when you act on, 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 on the state. Uh, and of course, you can put the operator in any of these uh, matrix elements here. This is completely cyclically invariant, as you saw from the pictures as well, or at least can imagine from the pictures. So we can just average that over all, uh, all these time slices of the system, if we like. So, so that's very easy. But sometimes, of course, we're interested in off-diagonal operators as well. And then it's, it's more tricky, and I will not discuss the most uh, general case. I will just... Uh, talk about one case, which is the simplest one. Namely, if the operator that you are interested in is uh, uh, some part of the Hamiltonian. So for example, if you are interested in, in the ke uh, kinetic energy, which in the case of the bosons we are looking at is, is actually the full energy, because we haven't introduced any interactions yet, uh, then what do you do? Well, so now you have, <coughs> have this uh, you know, kinetic energy here. Uh, and it turns out to, if you just even neglect the exponential operator, if delta is small, and so you just consider you know, having k here and no exponential at all, that doesn't change the order of the error of the whole thing, so it's perfectly fine to do. So then what we have here is, is uh, everything exactly the same as in the weight, except the last matrix element where we just have, have, have this k, and let's even just consider one, one particular uh, hopping term on, on, on two, uh, between two sides. So then we have one matrix element like that, and the rest is, is the same as before. So then we can multiply and divide that with the weight that was present in the partition function. So then everything cancels out except you know, the, these two. And here I have, a, again, uh, you uh, put in the expression to order you know, delta tau. <laughs> now you can see that this has a very easy, uh, evaluates to something very easy. So either if you, if you uh, look at some, somewhere where the boson jumps exactly on, on the site that you are considering, so then this matrix element is, is non-zero and it's, it's just one. Uh, and in that case, uh, you also uh, get a contribution from, uh, uh, from, from that one, from exactly the same term in that one, so that just becomes one over delta. But if there's nothing there, if there's no kink there, <coughs> then uh, you know, this is zero, so you just get zero. So, so that means that to measure the kinetic energy, what you have to do is just look at your, at your picture here, or of course you have it in the computer, uh, and count how many of these jumps do you have in the configuration? That's related to the kinetic energy. And if you put in all, <coughs> all factors as you should and, and so on, then uh, the total kinetic energy is ju just going to be minus the number of those jumps divided by beta. Okay? So what that then implies is since we know that the kinetic energy is proportional to the system size n. It means that the number of these jumps should always be proportional to beta times n. Right? So it, it will. Uh, so that means actually the density of these jumps. If you think of the density, uh, the probability of having it on one bond. Uh, you get by just dividing by beta and n, so the density is some, some constant, uh, the, the density of, of, of jumps. Uh, so that, that's an, an important concept. So, for example, what that means, again, if I go to the picture, is that if I make delta smaller and smaller, I get more and more slices, but at some point, the number of, of these kinks will not grow anymore. 
uh, the no total number of kinks will be constant, and on most of the slices, nothing will happen. So you will just have a, relatively speaking, small number of events and a lot of time where uh, nothing happens. Right? So I, I hope that's clear. Is, is that clear? Yeah, please. Uh, okay, so this was uh, <coughs> one over delta, uh, and then then that should be cancelled by something. Let's see now. <coughs> uh, yeah, it, it's okay. Or? Right. So let's see now, where, where is that cancelled out? Yeah, so you're right, it should be, oh, it's because, uh, you know, that's where the beta comes from. Because this was uh, on, uh, if I put it on, on one of these, so I'm again doing the trick that I can average it over all the places. So, so in the end, uh, I, I count all of them, but then I have to d divide by, you know, how many I have. And the number I have is beta divided by delta tau. So, so that, that, that will be cancelled out. Yeah, it, it's a good point. It, it may look confusing at first, but, but, uh, but that's exactly because eventually the probability of having a, a kink will be very small. So whenever, you know, so the prob probability of having a kink will also be proportional to 1 over delta. I think you can uh, be proportional to delta. So when you have a kink, you will, you know, get a contribution 1 over delta, but it's, cancelled out by the fact that the probability of having one is very small on the order of delta. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, so, uh, right. Now, okay, so uh, I will just quickly say what, what happens if you include interactions here. So now, if the Hamiltonian has two parts, a kinetic and a, a, a potential part, uh, then I, I can actually make an approximation, so the potential part is V. So, so this is, uh, you know, would be exact for, you know, normal numbers, right? But if, since these are operators that don't commute, you make an error here. Uh, but that, that's fine, uh, because it goes away in the continuum limit. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the potential part is diagonal in this basis, so it comes outside, it's just a number. Uh, and then if we do this at all time slices, we get exactly what we had before for the weight times an exponential of, uh, you know, all these interactions on the slices. So then when we try to do something uh, to the word lines, we have to take into account how the potential uh, energy changes as well. Uh, okay, so how exactly you do that, let me not get to, because I just want to basically introduce the formal aspects of the path integral so that we can make some comparison with the stochastic series method where I will talk about things in more detail. Uh, but I just want to point out still that you can take the continuum limit. So then the configuration start to look like, like this. Uh, the, the, there's no slices anymore. There's just a continuum of, of lines which have uh, straight segments and uh, you know, horizontal segments where uh, a uh, boson suddenly jumps to its neighbor. And again, the density of these jumps will, uh, will uh, be proportional to the kinetic energy. Uh, so that also means that uh, uh, the storage requirements of this method may not be as bad as you may have uh, imagined uh, initially. So if we look here, it looks like, okay, we should store uh, information similar to an icing model and the lattice size is the number of slices times the number of uh, lattice sites. And of course, if we make the number of slices go to infinity, that looks like it should be uh, you know, not possible. Uh, but in fact, it is possible because when we go to the continuum limit, uh, we can actually just store uh, the location of these events where something happens. So we just need to keep a list of events. Okay, and then we, of course, need to do some updates. <laughs> Let me just uh, not talk much about how we update these word lines, but basically, you again, would uh, introduce kinks, 
uh, and remove kinks uh, in a local way, but actually nobody does that because people have developed very smart ways to uh, make very big changes in these uh, uh, things. And those are called loop updates, and I will talk about loop updates in the context of the SSE method in a while, so I will not say what they are, but basically loop updates can not just change things locally, but they can basically change uh, uh, big pieces of the configuration at the same time. Yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, actually, the, the, you will sample over all of those. So, you know, uh, all possible paths are allowed, including what you say. I mean, uh, in some uh, site, maybe there's no kink at all. You know, it could just go straight. And in other uh, ones, there's a lot. And, uh, you know, when you do sampling of them, you will get the important ones uh, automatically. So then, of course, on average, you know, it will be the same, but there will be some fluctuations. I don't know if that's exactly answering your question, but. Okay, so you will use all coming features by type. You will assemble all possible. Yeah, but you do it all at the same time. So it's not like you sample one site at a time. Uh, you, you, you basically, it's like the icing model, right? If you simulate the icing model, you make changes in many different places, and in the end, the whole configuration changes. Uh, and, and you do that here. You can do some series of small updates, you know, considered everywhere, but you can do some, you know, more drastic changes as well. But it may become more clear when we discuss the SSC method where I think many things are actually a bit easier. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so let's switch to the series expansion representation then. So what, what we do then is we start from actually a Taylor expansion of this uh, exponential operator that we have to deal with. And uh, so what I've done here, again, I look at the partition function. I uh, Taylor expand the exponential, and I also express the trace as a sum over diagonal matrix elements in whatever basis uh, is convenient for us to use. Uh, and now uh, I want to uh, deal with these powers of the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian, of course, consists of uh, many terms. Uh, and I'm going to break up the power of H into uh, in, uh, sequences of all possible combinations of, of these operators. So formally to uh, denote those, I in, introduce uh, an index sequence. So this is a sequence of indices. So you see I have a power n, so I want to have a, uh, n operators. And uh, these a's here, they refer to you know, these indices here, which normally would denote where on the lattice the operator uh, sits. Uh, but it can be further decomposed as well. But there are some terms, and there are some indices referring to those. <coughs> so this index, again, goes between 1 to m, where, where m is just the number of different operators you have. OK, so now uh, if we break h to the n into all possible strings of these individual terms, I can write the thing as, as this. Uh, so now I just have another sum here, which is summing over all these index sequences, which is the same as then taking the power h to the n. So now you see what's done here is you have some state, and then there are operators acting on that state. And eventually, well, of course, when the operators act on the state, the state can change. But eventually, the state has to be coming back to, to where it started. So again, this is a, a kind of periodic structure here. <clears throat> now, when we decompose the Hamiltonian into operators here, what we require in this uh, context, and this is basically automatic for the spin one half models I'm talking about, but it's not always automatic. You may have to think a little bit, but it's always easy that when you act with one term on one of these basis states, you should get another basis state. It could be the same as well. But the point is that there should not be a sum of many states on, the, on this side, just one. That's how these operators are defined. So you can always split up the operate operations 
of h into such uh, terms. Then uh, there will be actually uh, uh, something very similar as in the path integral here. You, you have a <coughs> state which is evolving in, in, uh, in time, so you can think of this uh, dimension here as time as well, and there's a formal relationship between them, but I will not uh, talk about that. But if we again look at the hardcore bosons, then uh, you know these when these operators act, if they are allowed to act, so actually not all strings are allowed, because some of the strings could uh, you know try to jump a boson on top of uh, another boson. That's not not legal, and also we have to satisfy this periodicity here. So not all the paths or not all the operator strings are allowed, but for those that are allowed, in the case of the hardcore boson system, the matrix element is always one, so the weight of the path is just beta to the n divided by n factorial, which came from the uh, Taylor expansion. Okay, now we can really make uh, the relationships to the path integral clear by, by doing a bit more manipulation, which you don't really have to do if you make a program, but it's useful to see. So let, let's uh, define a, a partially propagated state. So I take this state and just propagate it with the first p operators, and then I call that alpha p. So that's some state that is in general different from that one. Uh, and then what I do is I, I just insert uh, those states between the uh, Hamiltonians, and you know that doesn't do anything. It's it's just uh, a notational thing because uh, h1 on a naught that is h1. So if we you know stick that, oh sorry, here's a, there's a typo. That should be h1 as well, and this should be yeah. There's a typo here, but uh, I, I should correct that before we post it online. Uh, anyway, so then uh, you know th it looks even more like um, like uh, the the uh, path integral. So we can actually draw identical pictures. So I will not repeat it here, but for the hardcore bosons, I could draw exactly identical pictures to what we do for um, uh, for for word lines for path integrals. Uh, although it looks like it's a bit different because the starting point was different and there's some different factors here and so on. But in the end, there's a clear relationship between these two and they are equivalent in, in, in some mathematical sense. But in, in practice, uh, it's often easier to deal with it uh, in, in this way. Let me derive some, some estimator here. Let, let's derive the estimator for the energy because that will tell us something uh, interesting and important again. So if I want to calculate, I haven't told you how to do sampling uh, yet, but I can just formally you know, look at things. If I uh, want to calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, uh, I have something exactly as I had in the partition function, but now I have another h there. And uh, so I had h to the n from the Taylor expansion and another h just from, from my, my uh, uh, expectation value of h. Uh, and then uh, I can just do a simple relabeling. So I say, okay, this is h to the n plus 1. So let's just call n plus 1 n and just relabel these sums. Then I have to correct in this factor, because if I put n plus 1 there, uh, I, I, I have to divide by n and multiply by n, n plus 1. Uh, sorry, divide by beta and multiply by n plus 1 up here. But when I relabel that to n, it's just n divided by beta. And, I, I, and there should be a minus sign as well, because there's a minus beta here. Uh, so then we can easily see that, OK, now this is exactly the same as, as the weight uh, was in the partition function, except that there's this n divided by beta there. So that then this whole expression is exactly of the Monte Carlo form. And we can evaluate the energy just as the expectation value of n divided by beta. So if we imagine that in the simulation this n is fluctuating, we are sampling also over all these powers, we should actually measure the expectation value of, <coughs> of that uh, power. And uh, it's also actually very easy to just take the temperature derivative of this expression and calculate the specific heat. And it turns, that the uh, turns out the specific heat is a kind of fluctuation of n. So that would be the variance of n here, but it's minus n. 
so what follows from that, if you think that the specific heat, if you, at least if you go to zero temperature, the specific heat is normally uh, zero. So if this is zero, it means that the variance equals basically the uh, average, average times beta. So from this follows that if we think of, okay, when we do this Taylor expansion, how high orders do we have to go to? The order we have to go to for this to converge is actually because the energy is proportional to n, so then that means that the expectation value will be proportional to beta times n. And from this, if we set the temperature to zero at least, uh, it means that the width of the distribution is square root of beta n. Okay. Uh, so that, that may now look crazy that we are doing Taylor expansions to the order of beta n because beta could be easily, let's say, a thousand and n could be, you know, 10,000. So then we are doing Taylor expansions to order 10 million and it's actually not too hard to do that uh, stochastically. Uh, and you may worry about some convergence properties and so on here, but trust me, there's nothing to worry about because we are working on a lattice, the spectrum is bounded, that means uh, this uh, Taylor expansion will always converge. For finite beta, finite lattice, the Taylor expansion always converges, and this is the order of uh, n for, for which it converges. <coughs> Actually, this is, let me show something simpler here which you can relate to. So if I just take a number, e to the x, and I write the, the Taylor expansion of that. Just n, x to the n, n factorial. And I just call this, I just call this W of n. So it's the weight of the nth term in the Taylor expansion of this. What does this look like? Well, let, let's say that x is relatively large, then it, it's easier to draw. Um, it actually will look something like like that. It will look. It's actually a binomial distribution, of course, <coughs> and um, and uh, this average n is is x, and uh, the width of the distribution is square root of, of x. So actually, this is like a, a Poisson distribution, I should say. It's, it's exactly the, uh, the Poisson distribution. So, so this has, uh, has the probabilities of that. So what we are doing up here is just doing this, but for uh, non-commuting uh, uh, operators. So we, we don't have just numbers. We have to deal with these, these uh, strings of operators. But this property somehow still goes through in some average sense, uh, that this average length of the sequence is related to the average of our operator. So that, that's quite, quite interesting. <clears throat> Say again? Oh, C is the specific heat, right? Uh, this, well, I think you know the physical meaning of that. So the, it was derived here, just by, you know, in this expression, if you just take the temperature derivative of this, you, this will actually come out uh, automatically. You can, you can try that. So uh, normally, uh, uh, unless we have some strange system, the specific heat should go to zero uh, when the temperature goes to zero. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm saying this here. It's not completely true uh, if the temperature, if C is not zero, but it's almost true. Yes. Oh, that's, that's the system size. Yes, I should have said that. So n is, n is uh, you know, the total number of uh, spins or lattice sites uh, in, my, in my system. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I should have. I think I said it before. But I should uh, write it out somewhere. <clears throat> okay, let me manipulate this a little bit more uh, before we, we do something with it. Uh, and actually, I'm going much slower than I uh, had hoped I'm seeing, so let's see how far we can actually get. Uh, 
Okay, so if we do sampling of this thing, uh, n is going to fluctuate, so we have to have some uh, Monte Carlo updates which increase or decrease n. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's a little bit annoying to work with a configuration space where the configuration itself is, is fluctuating, although it, it actually can be done, but it's a bit easier if we do a scheme which has a fixed uh, string length, and that can be actually be done very easily. So what we can do is we can truncate the expansion at some point, and you know you can see it from here since it's very similar from this. If we, okay, this is of course really discrete. I just drew it as a continuous line. Uh, this eventually decays exponentially. So if I do, you know, uh, some truncation here at at L. You know, nobody is going to care. You are never going to see, you know, the difference in practice because uh, it, it's exponentially small. So we can actually truncate the expansion at some, uh, also in, in the quantum case, at some n equals l, <clears throat> and then we can actually uh, do a trick. So if I have, a, uh, let's say here n is 10, and I have these operators. Now let's say my, okay, here I. Apologize, I call it M. I have somehow mixed pictures from different <laughs> presentations and not noticed, but okay, this L should be this M here. Uh, let's say I decide the max is going to be 14. Then what I can do is I, I can actually uh, put in some unit operators in this string just to make it look like it has length 14. So I can think of the unit operator uh, I or 1 or whatever we call it as. Uh, in a similar way as I think of, of uh, the Hamiltonian terms. So I can just uh, define, you know, H naught equals I, and then I can formally uh, regard it as part of the sampling of, of the terms of the Hamiltonian. <clears throat> but then I do an overcounting, right? Because this should just be one term. It should really be just that one. And if I distribute in all possible ways these unit operators, then I have to compensate for that overcounting, and the, over, the counting is just, of course, the combinatorial factor L over N. L choose N, so I just have to compensate for that. So then uh, this becomes my, my partition function. Uh, another typo here, this should be N, not M. Um, right, so, so this came from uh, you know, the compensating factor. So the n factorial is gone, and there's an l factorial instead, which is just a constant. And then uh, the, the summation over n formally went away. <clears throat> it's just that now n here has a different meaning. n is just the number of these operators, which is not 0. So n is still there, but it's not formally a sum here. It's, it's, uh, it's something which is uh, implicit. Uh, you just have to know each instance how many actual operators are here if you don't count these unit operators. So this makes the configuration space a little bit easier. And it turns out, and I will show that uh, this cutoff here, if you think of it here, uh, you can actually choose it automatically. You don't have to worry about it. The program can, can detect what it should be to, to be big enough. Okay. <clears throat> So now we are ready to actually do an implementation, which I think will make, uh, make the whole thing a bit clearer. So, so let's look at the 2D Heisenberg model. Uh, and I'm drawing pictures for the 2D Heisenberg model, but actually I'm formulating it in a way which is completely independent of the lattice. So I write my Hamiltonian as a sum over bonds, right? So in the 2D case, which I use for illustration, I have numbered my sites in some way, in some natural scheme, and I have numbered my bonds. The bond is, uh, uh, consists of two interacting spins, right? So bond one connects spins one and two and so on. Uh, so I can write my Hamiltonian as a sum over these bonds in, instead of the sum over spins if I introduce some uh, mapping I, B, J, B to correspond to these. So for example, bond 23, I23 would be 7, and J would be 11. So it, it, it refers to those uh, sites that are connected by the bonds. So if you have defined your lattice in the computer by a list of sites connected by bonds, then you can define the Hamiltonian like this. 
and the method I will talk to you about can be used for any model essentially without changes because it only needs that list of sites connected by bonds. But let's have the 2D case in mind because it, it's more concrete that way. <clears throat> okay, so you remember before I, I told you that we can write the Hamiltonian as uh, in terms of these uh, operators, one quarter minus SI dot SJ. Uh, so I have a minus sign here and a minus sign here. So this is what I'm going to do now as well. Uh, but I only wrote it down for the diagonal and off-diagonal terms uh, explicitly. So the Hamiltonian as a diagonal term, and now this is this one. Uh, actually, yeah, so, so if I define the Hamiltonian with a minus j, then the, you see that this is the diagonal part of it up to a constant, which we don't care about, of course. <clears throat> and then the off-diagonal part, the S X Y interaction, is again these raising and lowering operators. Uh, and now that comes with a minus sign because I had pulled a minus sign out uh, in front. So for the Heisenberg model, I, I uh, define for each bond two types of operators. The one is the diagonal and the two is the off-diagonal part. Okay, so this NB corresponds to the number of bonds, and I have for each bond, I have two types of operators. Okay, the reason I'm uh, adding this, or writing the interaction in that way, which has the effect of that one quarter there, is that then the matrix elements are all the same. All the non-zero matrix elements are the same, and these are all the non-zero matrix elements. So, so, uh, uh, there are only non-zero matrix elements of, of these staggered configurations when the spins are up, down, or down, down up on, uh, on in the bra and the cat. Uh, and they are all one half. And, and that's, uh, <clears throat> that's something which, which will make the scheme uh, much, much easier than if it's not the case. If it's not the case, one can still do what I'm telling you about here, but it's a little bit more uh, complicated, but still relatively easy. But I'm going to just talk about the easiest case. Okay, so then formally I write the partition function again like this. Uh, but this is the product now of, of this string of operators, and I, but I refer to the operators with two indices because of, of these, these here. So if this A is one, it's diagonal. If A is two, it's off diagonal. And then uh, I pulled out the minus sign here. So the minus signs cancel except for the cancel, uh, if, except for uh, the sign in here. So for each off-diagonal term, if I count how many off-diagonal terms I have here, and I call that n2, then I have a minus 1 to the n2 here. Uh, so that's what eventually can cause a sign problem, right? Because we would like everything to be positive, and everything is positive here. The only thing that could be negative is, is that sign there. But we will see later on that... <coughs> um, for bipartite lattices, it's nothing to worry about. Okay, and again, we do the fixed length scheme. We have the propagated states, and now I can draw a picture, which hopefully makes things clearer. So here I have an eight-site system, and this is now some representation that you can use in the computer as well, and there's a graph going with it. So I have eight spins. I denote them by sigma, and they take values plus or minus 1, although they are plus minus 1 half, but I can just call them plus minus 1. Uh, and then uh, this is, you know, this starting state. Uh, I call it just alpha here. And it's some up and down spins, red and white. And then I have some operators acting on the state, and now I denote the operators by open boxes for the diagonal operators and these black solid boxes for uh, of diagonal operators, and you see here, here's the diagonal operator acting, nothing happens, the state is the same. An off diagonal acts, and then these two spins are flipped. Here, there is nothing, so that corresponds to one of these, you know, unit operators that are just sitting there uh, doing nothing, and then, you know, some more things happen. And eventually, there are four spin flipping events here and the state is propagated back exactly to itself. So this is a valid configuration uh, of the SSC for this case. 
uh, and the way it's represented in the computer is that you have to store this state here, you know, which is the, the start or end state, it's, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, and then you have to store these A and B indices which tell you what type of operator and where it's located. Uh, and you can actually do that in a more compact way which not only saves memory but it's just, uh, well, it, it saves a bit time as well, I think, in the end. So you can just pack this into uh, one single entry. But b before I say, talk about that, let, let me again mention this sign problem here. So this sign, if you have a bipartite lattice, it goes away, and th th this is an example of that. That you have, you have to have an even number of spin flips for, to be able to propagate the state back to itself. If you have an odd number, you, you cannot satisfy the periodicity condition. <clears throat> so that's not true if you have a triangular lattice. So for example, on a single triangle, I show a case here, a spin configuration, and then uh, uh, here I, I, I just draw it in this direction. I act on these two spins, I flip them, then I flip those two, those two, and now I'm back to the original one, and I did it with three operations. So that means minus one to three, that's minus one, so that configuration comes with a minus sign. So we cannot do frustrated systems with this method because uh, it causes sign problems. Formally we can deal with it, but in practice it doesn't work. So let's stick to bipartite lattices where if you think a little bit, uh, it's true that we always need an even number of operators there. Okay, so this index which is used in the program which is available online, <clears throat> that corresponds to two times b plus a minus one. So if that index is uh, even, it corresponds to uh, a diagonal operator and then you just divide it by two to get the location. If it's odd, it's uh, an off diagonal and then you uh, I guess subtract one and uh, divide by two to get the location. Okay, so this is how the configurations uh, can be represented, just by uh, a spin state and uh, this string of, of numbers referring to operators. And we don't need to store all these states in between. Uh, we will later see that we, we occasionally need to st store a little bit more information, but basically if you have this information, you can recreate uh, all the spin states when you need them, right? <clears throat> okay, so here you can see that this is a complete discrete representation of, of the quantum statistical mechanics problem, but it represents the imaginary time continuum because there's no approximation here. This is completely exact. Well, we did the truncation, but I would argue that that's not an approximation because it can be arbitrarily good and, and never visible in practice. Um, and again, in principle, one can relate this dimension here to imaginary time, so we call it also here the time dimension. Uh, so this is a, an integer representation of the time continuum. So it's good to have the time continuum because everything is exact, but it's also good to have a discrete representation instead of working with continuous times because it's just uh, more practical and faster in the computer. All right. So another thing to note here is that uh, these are like the events that we talked about in the path integral and between events nothing really happens. So in some part of the program we actually want to store uh, these events and how they are related to each other and we will do that uh, by, by links. So we will call these operators and the spins that they are connected to, we will call those vertices. Uh, so these are, are the possible vertices that we have in the Heisenberg model. Again, they correspond to those non-zero matrix elements. So you see that it's up and down on, on either side of the operator. <coughs> and we call these the legs of, of the vertex, vertex and the, I number the legs in, in this way for convenience. So now a more compact storage of that whole spin configuration I showed you before is this one. I have the starting state, which is the same as the end state. Uh, and then I have these vertices and I have erased the spins that are not changed between events. And uh, in the computer, these will be represented by links. 
because it turns out that for some of the updates that I want to do on this uh, system, I will want to move among these vertices in the way they are connected to each other. So you can think of them really as, as connected to each other by these lines. <clears throat> and, the, in these, and these connections can be stored in the computer. Now I don't want to really go into details because it's, it takes a long time and it's just confusing. But basically there's some table that will allow you to jump, for example, from here to here. And then you may want to move there and jump and go across the boundaries. And all, all those things can be done in some uh, simple tables. Um, so those will be used for what we call loop updates uh, of the system. OK, so how do we actually do Monte Carlo sampling here? Uh, well, I indicated already that we will move around in this configuration. Uh, but we actually have two types of updates in this case. <laughs> <clears throat> and the first uh, one is, uh, uh, well, let me first say in general. So this was the, the configuration weight, okay? And this is just a picture of a configuration. Uh, and uh, as you remember now from uh, uh, Werner's lecture uh, yesterday, uh, you have an accept probability, which includes the weight, so this is the metropolis basically, uh, which includes the weight ratio. So if I change the configuration to something with primes on it, I have the weight ratio. Uh, but also what I think Werner called it a priori probabilities. The a priori probabilities should also uh, com come in there. So this is the a priori probability of, of going you know, from this configuration to that one or from that one to that one. Uh, if you do something like an icing model simulation where the a priori step corresponds to just choosing a spin at random, for example, <clears throat> uh, the one to flip, then that probability is always the same. So that those will just cancel out here. And in most Monte Carlo methods, those will just uh, uh, cancel out. But here, as you will see, it's not always true. So we actually need to to keep that. OK, that will be clear when we consider what we actually do. So let's talk about what we call the diagonal update. <clears throat> so you see, if we want to change something in this configuration, what can we do? Well, these diagonal operators, they don't do anything to the spin. So they're not associated with that many constraints. The only constraint is that a diagonal operator can only appear between unequal spins. I could not put it here, but I could put it there, for example. And I can always remove a diagonal operator that, that still leaves the configuration an allowed one. So I can remove diagonal operators and I can insert, for example, once uh, diagonal operators where there is nothing, where I have these you know, formally introduced uh, unit operators. I could introduce something there. So the first step of the simulation is just to insert and remove diagonal operators. So we go, can go from zero, zero, which, which corresponds to the nothing here, to some diagonal operator at bond B. OK? So to do that, we need to know what state uh, we have, because uh, otherwise we don't know if it's allowed to put it in there or not. Again, we cannot put it between parallel spins. Uh, and so to have those states, we can start here, and then we can start to do that here. Uh, and then we can go up, and whenever we encounter these off-diagonal operators, we just flip the spin. So we just one by one generate these states, and whenever we can, we do that kind of update. <clears throat> okay, but now there's an important thing to notice here. If you insert an operator, in principle, you can insert it at n different places. Okay, some of them will eventually not be legal, but a priori, there are n different places to put them. But if you remove one, you can, there's only one way to remove it, right? So you, have a, 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 you don't have balance there. You have n ways of putting it in, but only one way of taking it out. And that's why to get balance, detailed balance, you have to compensate by also including those select prob probabilities. So here, the select probability is 1 over n, because there are n places to put it. Going this way, the select probability is just one, because there's just one 
way to do it. Okay. Uh, so that is, is said here. Uh, and the weight ratios are easy to compute because n here just increases or decreases by one. So in the end, we have some acceptance probabilities of uh, inserting an operator or removing an operator. And those are very easy to do. Again, sequentially, just go, go up and, and try it wherever possible. And if it's not possible, it means uh, there's one of those guys there. So then you just flip the corresponding spins. OK. So I have a little piece of pseudocode how to do it, too. Uh, I think I should not. Well, we have a little time, so maybe I can say just a little bit. <clears throat> so you loop over, so it's basically what I just said. You loop over all those uh, locations in, in the space, in the time space. Uh, and then you look at this uh, uh, S, which encodes the type and location of, of the operator. So if it's zero, that means that there's nothing there. So then you can uh, generate a random bond and try to insert the operator at that bond. But if the spins are equal there, it's illegal. So then you just cycle. That means that you go to the next uh, point of the loop. So you did nothing. But if that's not the case, then you can uh, insert it with, uh, with, uh, by generating a random uh, number. And if, it, if that is successful, then you update this uh, uh, holder, the, the index corresponding to the operator, and you increase n. Uh, OK, uh, if, if there was something there already, you try to take it out with a pr some probability, and uh, you decrease n by 1. And if none of those hold, that means there's an off-diagonal operator there, uh, and the bond you extract from this s, and then you flip the spins at that bond. So you have made these lists of sites connected by bonds, and you work with those. So that, that's very easy to do, the diagonal updates. OK, but that's just part of the story. But that's already a big part, because what that will do is will, uh, it will fluctuate n, the actual number of operators, and it will uh, you know, put in uh, these diagonal operators at different places. So it will sort of sample locations of operators, operators and their locations. So the next update we are going to consider will actually not change the number or location of the operators. It will just change the types of operators, meaning diagonal ones can become off-diagonal ones and vice versa. So those we call off-diagonal uh, updates. The easiest way to do that would be just to consider pairs of, uh, uh, of operators where that's allowed. So for example, if you look at these two, of diagonal operators, I can just change them to diagonal operators. And in the process, the spins between them will change. But this is still a completely legal configuration. <clears throat> but you can only do that when there is nothing you know, between here. So for example, in this case, if I try to do that, you see that there's something in between which would no longer be legal if I change the spins uh, along those lines. So you would have to go and check where that's allowed, and you, 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 you could do it. Uh, actually, in this case, we can still do it if we consider the periodic boundary conditions and make the changes under and above instead. Then it's allowed in this case. But uh, those are local operators, and they are not lo local updates, and they are not very uh, efficient. And in particular, these winding numbers that we talked about cannot be changed. Th these correspond more or less to the small kinks that we removed and, and introduced in the path integral case, OK? OK, but here comes the nice thing. One can do something called uh, loop updates, or in this case, operator loop updates. <clears throat> and that's as follows. So you start somewhere. Let's say you start here. And then you always go to the next spin, the next leg on the same vertex. And then you jump to the one where it's linked to in this representation, where you think of these as physical links. You jump there, and then again you go to the neighboring spin. You move along the links, and you see that eventually that will trace out a closed loop in the system. It will always, no matter where you start, you can do this, and it will make a closed loop for you. And then what you can do, you can flip all the spins along the loop. So you should think of it as 
flipping all these spins that you hit, including you flip all the spins here in between, although you don't see them because we don't need to represent them, but they are still there, if you consider this representation with all the states. Uh, but in the process of changing the spins, also the operators change. So whenever you hit an operator, you change two spins, the type of the operator changes as well. Because this was diagonal, but now when you flip the spins, it's still okay if the operator is off diagonal. Actually, it's a bit redundant to even you know, draw these operators here. I don't even have to do it because just the four spins on the vertex completely specify what it is. It's just a little bit sort of added clarity, hopefully, uh, what it's doing. <clears throat> and you should also note that some operators may be hit twice and then the type doesn't change because it changes twice. So first it changes here to off diagonal, but then it changed back to diagonal when it was hit again. So this is really uh, very efficient, these up loop updates, because the loops can become very long and they can also change these winding numbers and so on. So, so this is what makes the scheme really efficient. Uh, okay, so I also have some pseudocode for, uh, for these loop updates, but since I only have six minutes left, I don't want to do it in, in, uh, really in detail. But the point is that one can make all the loops. So this is just showing one loop, but if I keep track of where I have been in this space, if I start somewhere else and make another loop and so on, eventually I will have covered the whole system by loops. And when I construct them, I also flip them with probability one half. So if you have heard about the Svensson Wang cluster algorithm, which you know is very common for simulating the Ising model, this is very similar to the Svensson Wang cluster update, but it's a loop update. But the principle is exactly the same. And uh, Werner will talk about that uh, tomorrow, I guess. He will talk about Svensson Wang, <coughs> so you can keep in mind that you have already heard about. A cluster type up, uh, algorithm for for a quantum spin system. Uh, okay, so here this is talking about you know this pseudocode about how you cover the whole system with loops and you put in some information in this. Uh, so, so I have made this list of that links these vertices and that's the list that you use to move in in the space. Uh, and basically you destroy the list as you go along it in it and put in some markers to indicate if the loop has been flipped or not. Um, and then you later will use that information to, to possibly change the spin state as well. Um, and okay, this looks a bit messy and I don't really have time to do it in detail, but it turns out if you want to do this really efficiently and also quite simply, you can actually work with bit operations, because when you have represented the operators in the way I do, with even and odd numbers corresponding to diagonal and off-diagonal operator, operators, you can just change from diagonal and vice versa by flipping the zero bit of, of that thing. So that's a very fast uh, operation. And also some movements in this list can be done with, uh, with bit flips. Uh, but I think uh, I will not talk about that in detail. It just gets boring. But uh, you can, I mean, there are papers, of course, discussing these things. And I will also be here all week. So if somebody is interested, I can uh, uh, talk more about it. And also there are these programs online, which I will point you to in a moment. <clears throat> okay. So after the loop updates have been done, you know, this, this, uh, spin state that we store, the starting and end state, which are the same, uh, that also can possibly be changed because you know, the loops can actually go across uh, that state and change the spin, so that has to be done explicitly because that state we, we have to store and it has, has to be up to date. <clears throat> and okay, I also discussed it, how to construct the linked vertex list, but uh, this is more for people who want to look at it later and, 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 and try to understand what it's doing. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not hard, but it, it's, you know, you can figure it out yourself if you have this kind of storage, what you would actually do, but, uh, but it's available for you. Okay, let me just now show some illustrations of, of how this is working. So I, I, I mentioned that this cutoff L can be done by the program automatically. So we have the equilibration part of the simulation. Uh, 
the burn-in, uh, somebody called it yesterday. So we can just start with basically an empty string and some random state and, and uh, some small n. And then we keep track of, of this n, you know, this uh, order of the Taylor expansion. And uh, if, okay, so we have all chosen some small l as well. So if n comes close to l, that means l is not enough. So then we just increase l. So we can say that l should always be something like n times one and a third of, let's say, the maximum n that has happened so far. <clears throat> so here's an example of that in an actual simulation of a 16 by 16 system. Here I started with l equals 20, I think. So l is this solid black line and uh, the actual n after each step is, is the black dots, and uh, the maximum n I reached so far is, is the red line. And you see, th this increases very quickly in the beginning, and then everything sort of flattens out and, and fluctuates. And this shows the probability distribution of n in a long simulation after I had fixed l to whatever it was here. <clears throat> and you see here that it fluctuates around 4,800. Uh, well, you see it here too. And, uh, you know, you never reach uh, the maximum, which is 6,500. So the maximum is, you know, out somewhere here. Clearly, that doesn't introduce any error at all. Okay, but you also have to make sure everything that these things are working, as uh, Werner mentioned yesterday as well. <clears throat> things can, in principle, go wrong. And, of course, you can make some coding errors. You may have some long you know, time scales that you don't know about. But actually, in this case, the time scales are normally not, not that bad. But still, you have to check, check things carefully. So one way to check is to check with exact diagonalization. So here I show something where we did a 4 by 4 system exactly. And in the 1D Heisenberg chain, you can also compare with the beta ansatz. There's an exact solution. So let me just flash you quickly the results. So here, the solid curve is the susceptibility versus temperature of this 4x4 four four lattice, and the red dots are the simulation results. And the error bars are so small that you really have to just take the difference of this and magnify it a lot to, to see the difference. So the difference is on the order of you know, 10 to the minus 6. And, uh, and you can see that to, to that accuracy, there's no difference, just consistent with statistical errors that you have to to compute, of course. <clears throat> and this was a really long simulation. It took, well, several days or maybe weeks. Uh, here are some results for uh, some long 1D chains, which illustrate also that you can get the ground state, because we can get the ground state energy from the beta ansatz, these lines for two pretty long systems, 1,000 and 4,000 sites. And as I increase beta, and this is on a log logarithmic scale, you see that the energy uh, becomes very consistent with those exact values. So this de definitely can give you unbiased results where uh, there are only statistical errors, no systematical errors. Okay, just quickly, uh, you can. this will be posted online so you can get the uh, URL from here. But basically, I have a couple of programs with a little bit of instructions here which do uh, Heisenberg 1D and 2D simulations. <clears throat> I can just quickly uh, show it, just maybe flash it, uh, just to show you that actually it's not a very long program. That's the main point I want to make. So here's the actual quantum Monte Carlo program. There's some instructions here, some, some comments. Uh, okay, let me not, not even say what the different things are, but okay, there's the diagonal update that we discussed. There's making the linked vertex list. So you see that's maybe, I don't know, 40 lines. There's the loop update, which actually is very, very short. Uh, this is just the loop update, but okay, it, it calls to smaller subroutines, but those are, are very small. So it's not much longer than that pseudocode that I showed you. Uh, and then it's doing some measurements and uh, writing some results and so on. But this is the whole program. It's maybe, I don't know, 300 lines. <clears throat> and this is basically research quality code. So you can actually even do some research probably with this code if you like. Uh, okay, I think I'm a little bit over time. So three minutes over time. So, or just 
one, I guess, because we started two minutes late. Okay, so thank you.